from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to a familiar passage of Scripture, Galatians, the sixth chapter, Galatians, the sixth chapter, and the 14th verse. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I under the world. Just after the war, Cliff Barrows and I uh, came together. He led the singing and I did the preaching. And his wife and my wife and the four of us went to England and we lived in England during the winter of 1946 and 47. Now London was almost totally devastated. And one of the things I remember is that in all that devastation after the war and all the rubble, there stood St. Paul's Cathedral. And on top of St. Paul's was a cross. I remember when Coventry Cathedral was being built because it had been destroyed during the war. And it was nearing completion. A cross was lowered by helicopter and placed on the top. A huge 25-foot wooden cross stands above the fields of the buried horror of Belson concentration camp. A tiny cross placed there by Sir Edmund Hillary, the first man to conquer the peak of mountains, is buried on the snow and the ice at the summit of Mount Everest. Now you, many of you, are very religious and you have embossed upon your Bibles a cross or you wear a cross around your neck. And the thing that I want to ask you tonight is this, what does the cross mean to you? Why do all the Catholic churches and all the Protestant churches have a cross? That's the one thing we agree on is the cross. The whole Christian world looks to the cross. Why did Paul say that he gloried in it more than anything else in all the world? Paul could have gloried in his education. He was one of the most educated men of his time. He could have gloried in his religion. He was very religious. He could have gloried in his ability to speak several languages. He was fluent in several. He could have gloried in the fact that he was a Roman citizen, but he didn't. Or he could have gloried in certain things about Jesus Christ other than the cross, his spectacular, miraculous birth, born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary, or the great teaching of Christ. Even today, educators say there's never been a teacher like Jesus Christ or his great social work his compassion for the poor and the needy, his concern for the hungry and the sick, his amazing resurrection from the dead, his future glory when he's going to rule the world and his kingdom is going to come. He could have gloried in any of those things, but he said, no, I glory only in the cross. And he said, God forbid that I should glory in anything else except the cross. Why? Well, I want you to think a moment and look at that cross. It was the most cruel of all punishments because the victims sometimes would hang there for several days. It took them several days to die. And on this occasion, they were crucifying three people, two thieves, murderers, and Jesus in the middle. The soldiers entered the guardhouse and brought Jesus with the two other condemned men. They were beaten 33 times or 39 times on their bare backs with leather thongs with steel pellets on the end. A crown of thorns had been put on Jesus' brow. A cross was laid upon his back. The procession started. Jerusalem was filled with a carnival-like atmosphere at that time. And the procession went through the main streets so that all might see that the criminal and be warned of a similar fate if he broke the laws of Rome. A big crowd was following. Just a few of Jesus' friends were following. And Jesus became weakened by the loss of blood and he fell. And so Simon of Cyrene, an African, helped him carry the cross. The soldiers went quickly and methodically about their task of driving home the nails in his hands and the spike through his feet. The crowd mills around jeering. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. They laughed and they mocked and they made fun of him. Come down. Do just one more miracle, they said. 
but he didn't do it. He stayed there. And you know why he stayed there? Because of you. Because he loved you. Because you see, only in Jesus Christ can we find forgiveness of sins. He was bearing our sins on the cross. People ask me constantly as they write, is there any hope for me? Can Christ save me? Prostitutes, alcoholics, robbers, murderers, prisoners, people filled with racial prejudice, people who hold in their hearts anti-Semitism. Is there any hope for me? People who have done many evil things, both corporately and privately. Is there any hope for me? A bishop of a church in another country came to me one time, some years ago now, and he told me that he did not believe that he was saved. He said, I've been to theological school in England. He said, I've been a bishop now, and he told me how many years. But he said, I have so many doubts that, I'm, that my sins are forgiven and I'm going to heaven. And he said, I've come to you to ask you if you would pray for me and pray with me. And very simply, I talked to him just like he was a little child, as though he had never heard the gospel before. Tears came streaming down his face, and he got on his knees, and he prayed a very simple prayer, which indicates to me that you can even be a clergyman, be in the church. I know a man in St. Louis, pastor of a large church. He was converted to Christ under his own preaching. He'd never known Christ, and suddenly the Spirit of God spoke to him. I know a man here in Boston who was pastor of a church that was dying. He had a brilliant education from one of your great theological seminaries here. And his little daughter got sick, and he thought she was dying. And he said, Lord, he said, if you will raise up my daughter from now on, I'll turn to the Bible and preach nothing but the Bible and accept your word as the word of faith. And that happened. Within a year, his church was packed out. Now he's pastor of a great church in Florida. Some of you know him. Paul gloried in the cross because it is the only way of salvation. Nothing else will save the cross is the only way. There is a way, the Bible says. Oh, there, there are other ways of salvation, so we're taught by many teachers that seemeth right, but the end thereof is the way of death. There's only one way, by the cross. And that's one reason why people don't like to talk about the cross or the exclusiveness of salvation. We like to think that there are many ways. And there are many ways that people worship and there are many ways that people pray. And God does hear the prayers of all people all over the world. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be heard. But there's only one way outlined in the Bible. And I, as a minister of the gospel, must declare unto you what the apostle Peter said. There's therefore now no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Jesus said, as I've already quoted, enter in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in there. Because narrow is the gate, and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Notice, he says, it's hard. It's not easy to follow Christ. You pay a price. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up the cross, you cannot be my follower. You see, we would like something cheap and something easy. His demands were so high that many people refused to go with him any further. They'd go so far and then they'd turn away because he turned to a crowd one day and said, count the cost. Count the cost. If you follow me, that means that I become Lord of your life. If you follow me, that means you become my learner, my disciple, and you must 
do my commands. You've got to love your neighbors yourself if you follow me. If you follow me, you've got to be concerned about the needs of the world. If you follow me, you've got to be willing to take up the cross. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to be executed. That means that you're willing to go back to your school and back to your home and back to your neighborhood and tell the people that you know Christ and let them see Christ in you. And that won't be easy. But if you'll do that, he'll be with you. He doesn't ask us to live the Christian life alone. I cannot live the Christian life. I'll be honest with you. I cannot do it. But Christ can live it through me if I will let him. And he can produce the fruit of the Spirit. He can give me a love and a joy and a peace that I'll never find anywhere in this world. He can give me the certainty of my eternal life. Now, Jesus also warned us that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not preached in your name? And in your name we've cast out demons. And in your name we've done many wonderful works. And then he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, you can go to church. You can be a good person. And maybe really never know Christ. I know many people that live moral lives that are agnostics and even atheists. There comes a point, there comes a moment sometime, somewhere when you must receive Christ into your heart. Paul gloried in the cross because it expresses the depth of sin, because it shows the love of God, because it's the only way of salvation, and fourthly, because he knew that it gave a new dynamic to life. Once you've been to the cross, you can never be the same. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, the Scripture says. You'll never be the same once you come to Christ. I remember the night I came to Christ. I stood with about three or 400 other people, made my commitment to Christ, and while I was standing there, I felt like a fool. I started turning around and go back. A woman next to me was weeping and I didn't have any tears. I had no emotion at all except fear, afraid that, of standing in front of so many people. But I went home that night and I remember it was a moonlight night. And we lived on a farm. And I looked out across the field and across the woods and I knew something had happened to me that night. I didn't know what, if you'd asked me the next day what had happened to me, I could not have told you. I now know. That first step was so weak and my faith was so weak and I had so many doubts. But my goodness, the transformation that began working its way into my life over a period of time was so tremendous. And it's still working. And it's still growing, and I'm still learning, and it gets better every day. And then f fifthly, fifthly, it's a motivation for service, a motivation for service. Did you see Mother Teresa getting that award? And then she won the Nobel Peace Prize two or three years ago, and she's won so many awards. And she said, I owe it all to the cross. Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize and they asked him something about it and he said, it was built upon my father's evangelical preaching. I know his father and I knew Martin Luther King, of course. And his father always preached the gospel and believed in the cross and so did Martin Luther King. Junior, do you know Christ? It's a motivation for service. What motivates you? To go out and help the hungry and the poor and the oppressed. My son spends his time, a great deal of it, in the third world, helping the poor and the needy, 
going to little dispensaries and little hospitals and sending doctors to help them. And he was out on one of those boats in the China Sea helping pick up those refugees a couple of years ago. What motivates him? Why does he go to some place in Africa, or go all through New Guinea, or go through India, or Bangladesh, or some of these places to try to help? Because he loves Christ. It's Christ that motivates him. What motivates you? Or do you have any motivation at all to help others? And then Paul gloried in the cross because he knew that it guaranteed a future life. The cross was followed by the resurrection, but God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And the scripture tells us in a grand anthem in the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter, and they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on earth. What a glorious future we have because of the cross. Some of you are watching by television. Pick up that phone and call that number that's there right now and talk to the person and tell them your need and share with them and they will talk to you. And you can find Christ tonight or you can find help for your problem or your need, whatever it is. Now, what was the attitude of the crowd that was there that day? Christ dying on the cross. First, there was the attitude of apathy. Sitting down, they watched him there. That's indifference. Many here this evening who are completely indifferent to what I'm saying and to the gospel. The mockings, the abuse, and the atrocity of that ancient pagan mob were less painful to Christ than the indifference of a modern world upon which the light of the gospel has been shining all these years. Here in New England, no place in all the world has had more gospel than you've had in your past history. How many today are indifferent? Too much is given, much is required. You see, more is going to be required of you. Where you've had the gospel for so many years and so many Bibles and so many churches and now the television and the radio, then those people in China or people in other countries that don't have the gospel as freely as we have it today. And then there's the attitude of the skeptic and the cynic. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you that destroy the temple and you build it in three days, say to yourself, come down from the cross. And there are skeptics here tonight. I know that. We've had many a skeptic come to the meeting and have his life changed. I remember the great scientist from the University of Minnesota who came. Skeptical. But three days after that service, he found Christ and became a wonderful Bible teacher on the faculty at the university. Then there's the attitude that saves. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister. And then there was the attitude of the centurion who said, Truly, this is the Son of the living God. My wife was born and reared in China. And in Chinese, the word come is written with three characters, each of which is a cross with a person on it. We're translating tonight in Chinese, both Mandarin and in Cantonese. The cross in all languages means come to the cross, find salvation. Come to the cross and find peace. Come to the cross and find forgiveness. Come is the invitation of the whole Bible. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and a heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to the cross. I'm asking you tonight to come to the cross. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. Christ has paid the price on the cross. He's been raised from the dead. That is the heart of what is called the good news, the gospel. The good news is that God loves you. He gave his son to die for you. He will forgive you of your sins. He will give you eternal life tonight. 
You don't have to wait till tomorrow, tonight. That's the good news, but you must receive it. How do you receive it? First, by repenting of sin. That means to turn, to change your thinking, to change your mind, to change your attitude, and to change your way of living. Let Christ come and be in control of your life. That's repentance. Saying to God, I have sinned and I'm sorry for it. Forgive me. That's repentance. But then you must by faith receive him, and that word faith may trip you up. Faith means that you totally commit to Christ. Just as I'm standing on this platform and my body is committed to this platform, so you stand with your whole life and everything you have, you put on Christ. Your hope is in Him and Him alone. He becomes the one that you trust totally and completely for your salvation. There was a minister preaching on the thief on the cross once and some man yelled from the congregation and said, what about that thief on the cross? And quick as a flash, the minister said, which thief? Because you see, one died and was lost and one died and was saved. And that's the only story of deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. So you better not wait. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise you tomorrow. And Jesus said you must do it publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I will not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. That's the reason I ask people to come forward publicly. You see, your coming forward doesn't actually save you. It's coming forward as a symbol of an inward decision you're making in your heart. You're coming and standing with Christ at the cross and saying by coming, I do repent of sin. I do want to change. I do want His forgiveness. I do want a new life. I'm going to ask you right now to get up out of your seat and do what we've seen thousands through New England do. I'm going to ask you to come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want sin forgiven. I want to know when I leave this stadium that Christ is with me and that Christ has forgiven me and that I'm going to heaven. If you have a doubt in your mind, don't you leave this stadium till you've settled it because you may never have another moment when your heart is this close to the kingdom of God. You're not here by accident. I believe you're here in the providence of God. You get up and come right now. We're going to wait on you. Hundreds of you, quickly. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium. This is a very holy and sacred moment. And you be in an attitude of prayer. You can bring your friend with you. If you're with friends or relatives or you've come in one of those buses, they'll wait on you. You get up and come and make this commitment. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want to speak on John's Gospel, the 11th chapter, the 25th verse. And Jesus is speaking to Martha. Lazarus has died, and Lazarus is in the tomb, and Jesus is trying to comfort Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. And here's what he says. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And she saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. You know, the Bible talks about three parts of us. The Bible says that we are built with three things. First, we have a body. Now, your body allows you to see people, to walk, to hear, to shake a hand, but the body can never make a friend. It is the soul and the personality that has the capacity to love a person and to have social relationships. And most of us don't like to go to funerals. We don't like to talk about death. And we in America have a great fear of death. And the Bible says in Hebrews, the second chapter, who through the fear of death were all their lifetime in bondage. The fear of death can hold you in bondage all your life. 
says the Bible. In Genesis 3.19, the Bible says, For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And in Genesis 5, it mentions this. It says this, And he died 11 times. You're going to die. Are you prepared to die? The Scripture says, Prepare to die. Prepare to meet God. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. But Satan whispered to Adam and Eve and said, Thou shalt not surely die. And he still uses the lie on you. You say somebody else is going to be killed in that automobile crash. It's going to be somebody else that's going to get pneumonia and die. It's going to be somebody else that gets cancer. It's somebody else that's going to have a heart attack. But one of these days, it'll be you. We look at our screens and we see motion pictures like Gable and Lombard or pictures on Marilyn Monroe and we think that they're alive or we even see former President Kennedy come back on the screen or Martin Luther King come back on the screen and somehow we get it in our minds that, that they're alive right now just like that in the same old body but they're not, they're dead. So the body dies. Everybody's body is going to die. Your body will go to the grave. The second part of us is called the soul. Sometimes we interchange it, soul and spirit. But I believe there's a difference between the soul and the spirit. But the soul, what is the soul? The soul can think, the soul can decide, the soul can desire. The soul can know, it can love, it can hate, it can react. To sum it up, the soul is that part of us that we call personality. Now, I have two dogs at home, German Shepherds, highly trained dogs, I might add. One of them's trained to run when you come, and the other one's trained to growl or bite if necessary. But you know, I've noticed that those dogs, they have emotions, they grieve, they, wor they seem to worry, if they're not fed in time. And they get angry and they love and they each have their own personality. Because you see, a dog has a soul, just like you did. The whole animal world has a soul. If animal has body and personality similar to humans, then what makes humans different? Have you ever thought of that? What makes you different than your dog? What makes you superior to an elephant? What makes you superior to any other animal? The third thing, the body, the soul, the animals have bodies, the animals have souls, but no animal has a spirit. The spirit is something that only humans have. Man possesses something in addition to his body and his soul that the animal does not have. He has the spirit. And the spirit is totally unique. The ability, you know what the spirit is? The spirit is the ability to know and to enjoy and to have fellowship with Almighty God. The God of the universe. The God that made the stars and the moon and the sun and the whole world. You, just little old you, can have fellowship with that mighty God because God gave you a spirit. You are a spirit. Your spirit lives in your body. You're born with that spirit, that ability to have fellowship with God. And the spirit makes even the lowest person in the whole world superior to the highest animal. Thus, the human race operates on three levels physically with the body, socially with the soul, spiritually with the spirit. Now the question is, what has happened to our spirits? The Bible says that our spirits are dead in sin and trespasses. We've rebelled against God and our spirits have been cut off from God and our spirits are dead. And the reason Jesus Christ came and died on the cross was to reconcile us to God. Sin has separated my spirit from God. 
I cannot fellowship with God. I cannot know God. I might study all my life theology and never find God. I might study philosophy all my life and never find God. I may be the most brilliant scientist in the world and never find God. Because something has become between my spirit and God, and that something is sin. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You are a sinner. I am a sinner, separated from God. This is a planet in which all human beings are born separated from God. You can be physically alive, soulishly alive, but spiritually dead. The Bible says, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she lives. There's a country western song this year that has an older cowboy singing to a younger one that's what needed is faster horses, younger women, older whiskey, and more money. And that's what the world is, alive but dead. Faster horses, alive but dead. Very much like the man Jesus told about who was a rich man, and he said, soul, take thine ease, drink and be merry. You've got many years. Build bigger barns. And God called him a fool, and God killed him that night. And God said, thou fool. Many of you think that you have years and years and years and years, and you don't know that at this very moment there is appointed a day that you are to meet God. And it may be this week. We never know. In this passage that I read, Lazarus, a person that Jesus loved very much and one of his closest friends, had died. And I watched the other night on television a replay of that magnificent picture of George Stevens, the greatest story ever told. And I thought one of the most dramatic scenes in the whole motion picture is when Lazarus is raised from the dead. And I thought of Lazarus as he was in that tomb. He'd been there for several days. And there are several things about him as I looked and thought about it. Lazarus didn't have any appetite. When he was alive, he got hungry regularly, but while he's dead, he doesn't have any appetite. And did you know if you're spiritually dead, your spirit is dead? You don't have any appetite for God. You don't have any appetite to read the scriptures and to have prayer and to talk about spiritual things. You're spiritually dead. You can go to church. Thousands of people today belong to the church that are spiritually dead. They don't really have any appetite for God, for fellowship with God. And the second thing about Lazarus I thought about was he, there was no activity. A spiritually dead person has no spiritual activity. They have much physical activity and social activity, but little activity on behalf of the kingdom of God. A few months ago, my wife and I went down to Guatemala with Luis Palau, who is here tonight. Right after the earthquake. And we saw devastation on a scale we have never seen anywhere in the world, and our hearts ached for those people. And I said, by the grace of God, we're going to do all we can for the hungry and the needy and the hurting people of the world, whether they're at home or whether they're abroad. Activity for the kingdom of God. And then another thing about Lazarus, there was no awareness. He was not aware of his friends. Dead men don't love. Dead men don't see danger. Dead men are, are unmoved by hunger. Dead men don't weep. And then the fourth thing, he was blind. And the Bible says that we too are blind. We have spiritual blindness. Your spirit can be blind. The Bible says the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. You are spiritually blind. And then the fifth thing about him was he smelled. He'd been dead for four days, and they said he already stinks. But you know what the Bible says? 
The Bible says all of our righteousness and our goodness that we try to pile up to please God smells in the sight of God. It's like filthy rags, the Scripture says in Isaiah 64, the sixth chapter. We're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then the sixth thing about Lazarus was he was bound. You know, the Oriental's method of embalming was one of the most effective the world has ever known. It consisted of endless wrappings. And yet, you are alive tonight physically. You're alive as far as your social activity is concerned, but you are bound and spiritually dead. You're bound by habits and sin. Johnny Cash talked a moment ago about drugs and alcohol. And men are bound by the chain of habit, the lust and sin of drugs, the lust for money, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, sex sins. All of that indicates spiritual deadness. Soulishly, you're alive. Physically, you're alive. But your spirit is dead toward God. Would you like to be made alive tonight, totally, completely fulfilled? totally alive, spiritually. What can you do? Well, let's think, what can we do for Lazarus? Now he's dead. Let's give him some food. They say, well, what we need to do is feed everybody. Jesus didn't feed everybody when he came. Do you know that? There are thousands of millions of hungry people in the world. We have compassion. We're to do what we can. But that does not bring about reconciliation with God. They have a deeper hunger, a deeper need to be met. And that's the need of reconciliation with God. You say, we'll give people better housing. That's all good. We ought to give people better housing, and I'm for everything that can give better housing to people in this country and people all over the world. But that doesn't bring back the spirit. The spirit is dead. Man has a deeper need. Man's greatest need is reconciliation with God, and that's what Christ came to do on the cross. You say, well, maybe they need more entertainment. Change their environment. You know, many intellectuals today, I notice, are growing uh, disillusioned with the whole human race. They're disillusioned because they fail to understand that the problem of the human race is a spiritual problem. The problem of the human race is not a soulish problem. The hu problem of the human race is not a physical problem. The problem of the human race is a spiritual problem. Man's spirit is separated from God. He hates, he lies, he cheats, he fights, he kills, he has war because his spirit is not right with God. So man needs to get his spirit straightened out with God. There's one great thing that a dead man needs. You know what it is? He needs life. And Jesus himself claims to be the life that spiritually dead men need. He said that the reason he came into the world was that he might give life more abundantly. He said, here's one of the greatest passages in all of literature. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, if you were a dead person lying in a grave, wouldn't you like to hear that? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. You believe in Jesus Christ. That means to commit to surrender your life to him, to receive him as your Lord and your Savior. And you can have spiritual life. In addition, the Bible says your body is someday going to be raised from the dead. You say, how can that be? I don't know how it can be. I only know that science says that no chemical is lost in the, in the world today, and the God that made it in the beginning can bring it together again. But your spirit will be joined to your body again in the future world if you know Jesus Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never, never, never die. Your spirit can be made alive and have fellowship with the God of the universe 
by believing in Jesus Christ. Now, that is essentially and basically what the gospel is all about, and that's why it's called good news to the world. That's what the word gospel means, good news. And it's good news to millions and billions of people who are dead toward God to say that there is a person that can give you spiritual life and change you and make you a new person. You don't get eternal life when you die. You get eternal life the moment you receive Christ. You can have fellowship with God through Bible reading, through prayer, through fellowship with other Christians. You have fellowship with God. Your spirit is alive. Your body may get tired. Your body may get hungry. Your body may be in prison. Your body may be destroyed by the scars of sin that have already taken place. But God will forgive the sin that came between you and God. He will help you and restore you in a thousand ways, but you've got to be willing to go all the way. You know why some people really never find God? They're not willing to go all the way. They want to go part way, third of the way, half way, three quarters of the way, 90% of the way, 99% of the way, but Jesus won't accept you. He says it's all the way. That's the reason he said in that chapter we read last night, he said, I will not commit myself to you. You believe in me, but I don't believe in you. I know what's in your heart. I know what you're holding back. You've got to be willing to surrender all if you are to have eternal life. Then he turned and he asked Mary and Martha, he said, Believest thou this? And Martha answered and said, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God that should come into the world. And you know, Jesus did an interesting thing. He wept. And the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Only three times did Jesus weep. He wept at the grave of Lazarus. He wept at Gethsemane the night before Calvary and he wept over the city of Jerusalem when he saw that Jerusalem was rejecting him as the Savior. And he weeps tonight, I believe, over the great cities of America as he sees the great majority of the people ignoring him, going on in their spiritual deadness like dancing on the Titanic before it hit the iceberg. And he weeps. There are millions tonight in the tomb of sin. There are thousands here tonight in the tomb of sin. You need to be awakened. Many of you are in the grip of an evil habit, too strong to break, worse than a living death. What was Jesus' answer? He went to the tomb and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Do you know why I believe Jesus wept? I don't believe Jesus wanted to call Lazarus back. Lazarus was already in heaven. I don't believe Lazarus wanted to come back. You get a person that has died and gone to heaven just for one minute and they see the glory of heaven. Why, you couldn't pay them enough money in all the world to get them to come back. You and I weep for them. They're not weeping, they're happy. Their spirits are happy in total fellowship with God and their friends and the reunion and the happiness that's taking place there. Jesus wept, I believe, because he didn't want to have to call Lazarus back, but in order for his credentials as the Messiah to be established, he was going to raise the dead. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. If he hadn't said the name Lazarus when he said, come forth, every person that had ever died in the history of the world would have come out of the grave. So he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. But Lazarus was still tied in the old clothes. Jesus said, loose him. Now you and I have to be loosed. After we come to Christ, we have to be loosed from our sins. 
the things that bound us. We have to be set free. And there's many a person that says to me, Billy, I would like to come to Christ, but I don't think I could hold out. You're right. You can't hold out. But he'll hold you. And Johnny was telling us a moment ago about that verse in 1 Corinthians that he came across, and what a marvelous verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear, but will with the temptation make a way to escape. And even I forgot it, Johnny, because the, there's a phrase there that says God is faithful. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted. In other words, God makes a provision for your Christian life. He gives you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside and gives you supernatural power to live a supernatural life. And your spirit is made alive and you have fellowship with God. I'm asking you tonight, will you receive Christ? Are you willing to go all the way with him and commit everything to him? Your mind, your heart, your body, your friends, your family. And you would like to say tonight, I want my sins forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want eternal life. I want Jesus to come into my heart tonight. I'm going to ask you to do something that we cannot do tonight. Every night, this stadium has been almost filled, not quite like it is tonight. And we put people on the floor tonight, and when we put you on the floor, we knew that we could not call people forward as we normally do. So I'm going to ask all of you that want to receive Christ, I want you to stand up where you are. We're not going to ask you to come forward. Just stand up where you are and stand there quietly and prayerfully and with bowed heads. And I'm going to ask every head bowed and every eye closed and everybody in an attitude of prayer. And tonight you want Christ in your heart. You want eternal life. Just stand up and keep standing all over the place. Hundreds of you, just stand up right now. And everyone in prayer. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. 